All right, folks, as you heard, we are going to talk about adaptive robotics. And before we get into today's article, I want to talk about Mauser Electronics. So you guys have heard us talk about Mauser so many times on this podcast. They're one of the world's biggest electronic distributors. And we, we've always mentioned how by being one of the world's biggest electronic distributors, they have like insight into industry and academia and they bring everyone together. They share articles and technical resources that we like to share that are great primers and things like that. But they also give how to's for hackers that like to put stuff together. Well, this technical resource that we're going to talk about today is one of the hackers in the community um, that was actually sponsored by Mauser. We're going to be talking about Jonathan Schultz, who's the founder and captain of Team Huge of the BattleBots competition. Um, Jonathan. I love BattleBots, dude. Dude, it's sick. If you're into like uh, engineering, I, I think that's like, it's our, our version of F1. Uh, technically, F1 is our F1, but you know, you know I was going mean? to say, F1 is pretty F1. It's like our version of WWE. Yes, it's our version of WWE. I like that. It, it's our Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather. And uh, well, that's that's UFC, but that's, you know what that's I mean. UFC, buddy, but it's okay. You, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm showing my true colors of not knowing sports, but that's besides the point. Um, what's cool about this is that in this in this technical resource, Jonathan is talking about, you know, how he got into robotics at first. It was just like something in college, a hobby. He got into it with his college buddies and his girlfriend. And they started building um, this robot. The name of their team is huge. The robot's name is huge. And it has this like very interesting design. It's basically two big wheels with the core components in the middle. And the robot itself is like, what, a foot or two off the ground. And I don't know if you've ever played this video game but there was a video game on the playstation one called twisted metal where this guy where you would you know drive around cars and shoot each other up and this guy uh, was strapped between two truck wheels and he was like the best character ever and that's what their robot reminds me of like the wildest design you could think of just two big wheels roaming around destroying other robots what i loved about this technical resource is not only the fact that we see jonathan talking about the different iterations of huge and like where the team is now and how they're competing in the Olympics of, you know, these robotic death matches, which is BattleBot. But also, um, he, he spoke a little bit about the design. He was like, look, we, we saw what most people were doing. And that was, you know, you have your core electronics that you want easy access to. And um, you hit it all behind this cover that was very easy to remove because, you know, you, you might need to make adjustments before your robot goes in or if it's hurt, you take it out, you're doing whatever. And um, because they want easy access, the top cover is usually not super secure or made out of great materials. So he was like, that's our competitive advantage. That's how we're going to design our robot to just beat the heck out of other ones. Um, I'm not going to talk more about it because I want you guys to go and see this entire interview that they did with Jonathan. I think it's super interesting. They have a ton of pictures of the robot. And um, the design that they came up with actually bleeds very nicely into today's article. Well, I was going to say, we're going to link that article in the show notes, mm -hmm. right? You should go check it out. But I want to highlight, right? Team Huge's partnership with Mauser. They say this helped them pave their way into the BattleBots competition. Awesome. Like, epitome of what Mauser is for makers, right? Like, the, they help pave the way for makers. That's cool. But the other part there is we always talk about how well connected Mauser is with industry, with technology. Mauser is also really, really connected with the garage hackers too. Yep. And this is a this is an awesome example of that. And I don't know about you, but I would put myself in the garage hacker category. So I've got like a special affinity for this type of article. And like, I think everyone should check it out. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. And I think that, that just goes to show like, you know, this is why we love Mauser. Just the type of connections that they have blends so nicely with all the topics that we love to talk about. Um, I'm with you, man. But that's a great, again, it's a great segue to today's article because we're going to talk about the new bio-inspired robot from Caltech that is supposed to fly, roll, walk, and more. It basically just is every version of traversing through an environment, this thing should be capable of it. Um, again, which, which is why I think Jonathan's robot is, is, goes hand in hand with this article. But I'm with you. Talking about who's involved in this work, it's a collaboration between Caltech and JPL. And if you remember a couple of episodes we've done in the past with, with Caltech, they actually work with JPL a lot because Caltech has a, I think, a combined uh, set of efforts with JPL. They're, those two institutions are very close with one another. So this research makes a ton of sense for them because when you think about traversing through an environment that's mostly unknown, 
having an environment, having a robot that can adapt to its environment um, through different methods of locomotion actually makes a lot of sense, right? Instead of hard coding it to only drive or only walk, now you're able to have a system that can determine the most efficient, most optimal path forward based on what is in front of it. Well, and for people who don't know what JPL is, right? That's NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, so NASA, right, doing everything they are to put stuff into space, to explore our solar system and the rest of the universe. Um, th they've had challenges so far with traditional robots, um, sending them into a diverse or an unpredictable environment because you're not sure what the requirements are. You're not sure, does it have to roll? Does it have to walk? Does it have to crawl? Does it have to stand? Does it have to fly? Can it even fly? Is the atmosphere thick enough for that? Right. Um, so we we've had challenges developing robots to be the pioneers because we first have to send a couple probes to collect a ton of information, collect a bunch of pictures, do a bunch of tests. Then we have an understanding of what the basic requirements are. And then we can build a purpose-built robot to go do that. And oftentimes we have to iterate a ton. You know, the first rover dies, the next one's not that great. And by the time we get the third or fourth or fifth rover onto that planet, we do a pretty good job of exploring. Um, I think now what this team um, from, like you said, it's the CAST Center at Caltech, Center mm -hmm. for Autonomous Systems and Technologies. And I think the autonomous part is something interesting we should definitely hit on Absolutely. as a part of talking about this article. But they're trying to make this like most multi-purpose or multimodal transportation robot that's ever been built. Um, they say it's got eight different modes of transportation. Um, I could only see six of them listed in the article, but those six are rolling on all four wheels, turning its wheels into rotors to fly, standing on the two rear wheels like a meerkat to peer over obstacles, walking by using its wheels like feet. Um, fifth one's using two rotors to help it roll up steep slopes on two wheels, and then the last one's tumbling and rolling. I, I, I don't know what the last two are there, but like, even if you had you know you had me at the first six if you told me it had six modes of transportation i would have been excited about it but the idea here is going onto a new planet you can send something like this that's agile enough that's you know adaptive enough to be the pioneer or to be maybe the second thing that goes onto the planet instead of the 10th or 11th or 12th thing you're able to explore a lot more you're able to understand a lot more um in complex terrain such as other planets and then there's also the added benefit of like us being able to use it here on earth as well. Absolutely. And, you know, in, in this podcast, we have actually talked about um, different modes of transportation for autonomous systems on other planets, specifically the Martian rover and the uh, drone it had on board that was trying to be like the first of its kind. So we, we've talked about the benefits, the challenges that come with it. And that's, again, kind of what you summarized earlier, but you're absolutely right. Like, this system makes so much sense if we are to actually, you know, take our extraterrestrial investigations and adventures even further. Now, uh, I, I want to quickly talk about the name of this system that these folks have come up with because I think it's dope. Uh, Multimodal Mobility Morphobot, dubbed the M4. As a fan of BMW, uh, M4, perfect. Perfect name. Absolutely. We're, we're we're a big fan of good naming conventions, good acronyms. I would I would put this one up there and like eight. I'll give it an yeah. eight. I I was gonna say like eight point two out of ten. Okay. Right? Okay, Great being job, more folks. generous today. I respect that. Um but this thing has I, I guess if you were to break down the system, it really shines because of his because of the appendages it has. I'm not gonna call them wheels, I'm not gonna call them rotors, we're just gonna call them appendages because it can walk and other stuff. But these things can be reconfigured to, like you said, walk, um, roll over, fly, or drive. And the control system, in addition to the actual hardware that's enabling you to do that, that's fascinating. But you talked about it's important to mention the AI system that's in play here. The AI algorithm that's on board this system that allows it to perceive what's in front of it and then choose the best traversing. Um, option that's available to it to you know move through it that's that's the real juicy bit of the secret sauce if you ask me yeah i i agree man right and i want to go back to something you just said which is you don't want to call them wheels or thrusters or legs because you want to call them appendages i was going to go the opposite way and say you can call them wheels and you can call them legs and you can call them thrusters all of those are correct right each one of the four appendages 
has the ability to roll like wheels, has the ability to walk like legs, and has the ability to fly like thrusters. So if you combine all those, that's how we're getting to these um, six or eight different modes of transportation. But what, what I found really compelling as a part of that is that each of those are drawn as an inspiration from nature. Mm -hmm. um, so they talk about how they looked at things like birds to understand the flight patterns. They looked at things like sea lions to understand how they walk with like these big fat appendages that don't <laughs> don't have the ability to like w with many joints in them. Um, and they also mimicked, um, I mentioned it earlier, like how a meerkat peers over obstacles. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there are other, right, that only covers three mm. or so of their six different movements, but there's a lot that they studied from nature here. So in addition to this AI system that can autonomously choose the most effective locomotion mode, I think that's really, really interesting. I would say the second part of the secret sauce here is the fact that they studied nature as an ability to try and understand what's the most efficient way we can use these appendages. Um, as opposed to tree, try and re ha, ha, reinvent the wheel here. Um, it, and instead of trying to reinvent modes of locomotion, they looked into nature and understood how are birds doing this with the, you know, the least amount of body parts possible? How are sea lions, you know, making their way through the world with the least amount of complexity in their appendages possible, drawing inspiration from nature and then including that as part of the mechanical design. In addition to using this really interesting, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, which you can argue is bio-inspired engineering of of thinking, of thought, right? Processing. Um, so they're they're bio-inspired in the brain and then they're bio-inspired in the body of this robot. And that's how we get this awesome M4 robot that can travel using eight different modes of transportation. Yeah, I mean, the, the article name starts with bio-inspired, so you're absolutely right. The inspiration from nature is like such a critical component of it. And I'm, I'm going to go back quickly to the bird that you mentioned. Um, I forgot the name of the species. But they were talking about how this bird, like they noticed that as it tries to jump up on steps, it doesn't just use its legs. It gives itself a little push with the wings. So it's making use of its legs and the wings to overcome that obstacle instead of just trying to fly all the way up or walk all the way up. I think it's the chuker partridge. That's the one. That right, is and the I, one. I agree, right? It's super interesting. That's, that's where they got one of those additional modes of transportation where it's not only jumping with its legs, it's also using its wings to fly. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's super interesting. And, and the, also, if you look up a chucker bird, it, it's, it's kind of pretty. <laughs> I just Googled it. You get look, to do looks research. Pretty cool. it's, it's got like zebra stripes on the wings, got an orange face. Looks pretty cool. Looks like a hawk, meta Oreo, meta zebra, and turned into a bird. You get to do research with some, uh, some incredible views. Who doesn't love that? Yeah. But what I was going to say, I think like within our first three episodes of this podcast, I believe we did another. Um, we did another set of coverage on Caltech and their bio-inspired robotics, and it was specifically about the flight of a fly. And they use that to uh, change the algorithm of how a drone maneuvers. And it, it seems like this has been a key interest for these folks to try to bring how nature operates into our robotic systems. And, you know, again, we've, we've talked about research articles that go over this, but then you look at the, the main robotics uh, laboratory that everyone from like twitter to academia is, is in love with which is boston dynamics we're literally trying to make them operate like human beings or like animals with the cheetah dog right yeah and i don't know it, it's just fascinating to me that like at the peak of engineering we're still going to mother nature to to be, to be inspired and to be schooled in what what the proper technique is no i i'm with you and i will make a minor correction there you had a good guess on which episode one, you know, first three it was. It's it's the first episode. Okay. <laughs> first, very first episode of the next flight. Um, I think it was a team from Penn State, though, is Penn State. studying flight from flies. <laughs> okay. Um, that being said, that was a super interesting article and was also a lot of episodes ago. So if you're willing to go all the way back and listen to that, I think you'll enjoy not only the subject matter there, but also hopefully seeing how far we've come over the last two and a half years of doing this podcast. If you go back and listen to episode one. The fact that my recollection was correct halfway for uh, something that happened 132 weeks ago, that's, I'll take it. That's I know, dude, <laughs> you're, you're, uh, your memory nailed it right there. <laughs> but um, in, in terms of, you know, this, this technology is also obviously super, super cool. But in terms of the so what, we've kind of covered the main one, which is, you know, the collaborations with NASA. NASA's doing space exploration. That'd be super cool. But there's one that I specifically wanted to call out, and that's like this critical flaw that we see with last mile, de last mile delivery with drones, right? Like 
people hate the noise. There's all this regulation. And there's some solutions about like, what if we have one drone that's flying super high so no one can hear the noise? And then we lower another drone that's actually like making the delivery. There's some um, some folks that even we know personally that are working on designs for different rotors that can be quieter, like all these things, all these efforts to make it possible. But one thing that makes a ton of sense to me is getting drones close enough to where they're supposed to do delivery um, via flying. And then once they get close enough to a neighborhood, they land. And just like you and I experience with uh, Starship Robotics at Mason, they roll their way to the delivery point and then you kind of eliminate the issue that you know people hear these things outside of their home and they're just flustered by all the noise. No, I, I agree, dude. And that's something I didn't even think of when I was looking at this. One of the things that I thought of um, outside of the entire you know, space exploration, sending a robot as a pioneer on a new planet, um, was using this. Um, I think it's got great potential for emergency rescues. Agreed. Um, Say, say you've got something like a building that's partially collapsed. Um, you're not able to like send a, your normal drone up there to go walk up the stairs because the stairs are collapsed, but there still might be people or things you want to go check out at the top. You could fly this drone to the top. And then once it gets there, if there's any surfaces intact, it can walk around or it can, you know, drive around on its wheels, you know, all these different modes of transportation. I thought that was something that was really interesting here um, in terms of space or sorry emergency exploration but mm -hmm. i didn't even think about the last mile delivery thing man I, I think that's really awesome and it kind of combines a lot of the best of what we're best of all the worlds that we've been hearing about in the last mile delivery realm which is like can we use a vehicle to drive part of the way can we use drones to go part of the way um can we take drones to deliver packages to vehicles and then use those vehicles to deliver the last part of the way you you i think you hit the nail on the head here which is like if we can have this bio-inspired robot that's capable of doing driving, walking, flying, and more, you've got an all-in-one solution as long as it can carry the payload properly, right? Where you can take a package and put it on there. It can fly from its distribution location out to the delivery area, drive up to the front door so it's not invading anyone's privacy or making a lot of noise. Um, sounds like something super interesting, man. That's what I'm saying. And Amazon can finally keep their promise of giving me my package in the next day instead of promising it's going to be the next day and then shows up two days later. Dude, you, I mean, Amazon is impressive all on their own without this technology. Sometimes I, I order a package and get it the same day and I'm surprised that they can keep that promise. But maybe it's because they're keeping the promise to me that your packages keep coming late. Probably, probably. They just like you more than me. That's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, before, before we wrap up the episode, I want to quickly do a recap of what we just talked about. So. Generally speaking, when it comes to unexplored terrain, it's difficult to know what locomotion platform is going to be best. Are you going to fly? Are you going to drive through it? Or are you going to walk through it? You don't know, right? There is a most optimal path. There is a most efficient method. But most systems, especially our rovers that are exploring the Martian uh, landscape, are accustomed to, juice, to just do one of them. So this team, this collaboration between Caltech and JPL, They've come up with a system that is capable of driving, walking, flying, and even more modes of locomotion. The best part, this thing comes with AI on board so that it can perceive what's in front of it and adapt to the best method of traversing through that obstacle or through that terrain. That's what's amazing about it. We are able to explore the unknown with the best possible tool that we can have. That's the magic. Now, not only is this great for space exploration, this could potentially mean that your Amazon deliveries can be finally be made with drones that can drive up a certain way, fly up a certain way, and even walk up to your house and drop it off so that they're not disturbing you. Boom. Mic drop. I love it, man. I did my best. Um, yeah, I think we're good to end the episode. Yeah? Yeah, I will just say, if you made it around to the end of the episode, we appreciate you for listening. Um, lots of people have reached out asking how they can help. What can you do to help the next boy grow to reach more people? Um, there are two things that I'm going to ask from you. Number one is if you're already on your podcast app, um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you're at, if you could leave us a review, we, we'd love if you could leave us a review, leave your feedback. We hope we deserve five stars. That would help us reach other people. Um, the second thing that you can do if you've already done that is send this episode to a friend if you've enjoyed it. Um, I think this is a pretty interesting topic to share with a friend. This robot that has eight different modes of transportation, that's something that might be perfect to invite a new friend into the world of the next bite and help continue to keep us growing 
um, you know, and because of people like you that are helping share this with everyone else, that's what allows us to continue to produce this podcast on a weekly basis. And don't forget, friends don't let friends miss an episode of the Next Right Podcast. They definitely don't. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, we'll catch you in the next one. Peace.